Uh, welcome to uh, this week's seminar uh, for, for the City Futures Research Center. My name is Dr. Lee Roberts. I'm a research associate uh, at, the, at the center, and I'm one of the organizers of this seminar series. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to acknowledge that UNSW's campus here, where we're meeting, at least in the room, is on the unceded lands of the Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and, and present, and uh, also to any First Nations uh, people who may be joining us today. Um, before we get started, I'll do kind of our usual thing. I'll introduce our uh, center director to do the introductions for our speakers, but I'll do a little housekeeping first, uh, especially for those of you joining us online. If you could uh, do us a favor and mute your microphone and turn off your cameras during the presentations. Um, uh, and then uh, we'll have Q&A at the end, and so you're welcome to turn on your microphones and cameras at that point if you've got a question. But you can also put questions into the chat at any time, and uh, Richard will be monitoring the chat so he can uh, forward your questions on to the speakers for today. And we have two speakers today, so we're going to do kind of a tag team. We'll do a presentation, then a Q&A, and then another presentation in the Q&A, so it uh, should, should be good. Um, so with that, I'll introduce Chris Pettit, who's the director of City Futures Research Center. Okay, well, welcome everyone um, to our seminar series. Um, we're very delighted to have um, our guests. We have um, two esteemed professors from Italy um, that are with us today with two presentations. We've got some um, Professor Marta Butero, who's going to be talking about strategic assessment using multi criteria mm. evaluation techniques. Um, very interested to hear about this work, Marta. And um, Marta is a full professor in planning evaluation and project appraisal at the Inter University Department of Regional and Urban Studies and Planning. That's a bit of a mouthful. Mm. At Polytechnic University of Torino in Italy. Uh, where she teaches urban management, multi-criteria, analysis, environmental assessment. She holds degrees in environmental and land engineering and a PhD in environmental assessment. Scientific interests focus on methodologies, techniques and tools for supporting sustainability assessment of urban and territorial transformations. And she has visited a few universities. We're very lucky to have uh, Marta as a visiting fellow uh, with us here at City Futures at UNSW, but she spent time at NUS in Singapore, QUT, um, our colleagues there in Brisbane, mm -hmm. and is at um, Damsadi in Paris. And um, so Marta is going to have her presentation first, which is going to be more the, the quant side of the coin. Mm -hmm. And then um, we've got uh, Professor Marco Santangelo, who um, is also from the same university, from the same department. Um, and he's chairperson for the um, Inter-University PhD program um, in urban regional development and vice chair for the School of Planning and Design. And his interests are in the field of spatial governance, local development processes and policies, and has started more recently to focus on urban development strategies, um, which are impacted by the, the growth and import importance of universities, higher educations, um, and has also travelled and visited in US um, QUT, but differently, University of Tokyo. So we've got our, our qual and our quant presentations, mm -hmm. and um, Marco will be talking about the role of universities and cities, which is very, very topical for us here in Sydney because we have a number of universities, top two, um, two universities in the top 20 in the world, ourselves, University of Sydney. What does that mean for our city? So. Um, I'll ask um, Professor Butero to the platform. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Please. My talk. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this uh, uh, opportunity of exchanging. Um, research and uh, experience with uh, with you we are a very uh, we appreciate very much this and for the warm welcoming that you you gave us so uh, the title of the talk as uh, you said is strategic assessment and multi criteria analysis so i will try to cut a little bit uh, the research activities that uh, 
I um, I have developed so far during my uh, experience uh, talking especially on this uh, family of method, which is uh, multi criteria analysis. So I will escape this introduction and I will go immediately to the outline of the, the presentation. So I will try to introduce briefly the concept uh, in the background of uh, the research activities that are more in concerning sustainability assessment and uh, urban system as a, a complex system. Then I will talk a little bit about uh, the main evaluation method that we face during our research activity. Um, I will present multi-criteria analysis uh, uh, from the theoretical background and uh, with reference to the development of a specific method considering a case study application. And finally, I will try to summarize some conclusive remarks. So uh, the first topic uh, of, uh, let's say, uh, in the background of the research activities, as I was saying before, is about sustainability and sustain sustainability assessment. So we work in a faculty of planning and architecture, and we try to deliver our, uh, let's say, uh, evaluation method in order to support the planner, designer, and generally speaking, decision maker in achieving sustainable development uh, Goal. In specifically, we are interested in sustainable development goal number 11 in the general framework of the SDGs as defined by the United Nations in 2015, which mainly focus on uh, sustainable cities and uh, society. So in this, uh, uh, this is a very important uh, topic that we try to consider always in our uh, develop in the development of our activities and it is of course a multidimensional concept because it involves different issues and different aspects that range from environmental aspects of course but also economic elements social inclusion cultural valorization technological elements um, and so this is something that we have to face using the multidimensional evaluation framework also in the research activities. And the other issue that is very important in, uh, in, um, in, uh, in the research activities that we develop is about the complexity. So uh, under this perspective, uh, urban project, uh, urban plans, uh, and generally speaking, urban decision problem represent a weak or semi-structured, unstructured problem as they are characterized by multiple actors that range, uh, for example, from local population, political decision maker, expert and practitioner, economic actors, and so on that many and very often push different uh, objectives and sometimes these objectives are also conflicting among them. Um, and above all, there is also um, a, a very high level of uncertainty leading this kind of decision problem. So in this uh, sense, uh, different uh, evaluation methods uh, are available in order to support the decision making process in uh, addressing in a, let's say, rational and robust way this complexity that uh, is made by um, possibility of having different functions for a certain, for example, project of urban development, different objective and stakeholder, as I was mentioning before, and different resources uh, at stake that range from natural resources, for example, but also economic resources, cultural resources, and so on. So in our research activities, let's say we try to manage uh, uh, the multidimensionality of uh, sustainability with uh, particular reference to the complexity of the system uh, that we have to face. Uh, so in this slide, uh, I try to represent uh, the, let's say, the, the um, taxonomy of the evaluation method that uh, we uh, normally uh, consider in our research activities using this taxonomy that uh, uh, consider to divide uh, the different method uh, according to the unit of measure that they use in the development. So we can have monetary method and non-monetary method, and also qualitative and quantitative method. So in the first quadrant, for example, we consider the, let's say, most 
traditional evaluation method that are, for example, the cash flow analysis or the cost benefit analysis that enable to assess the feasibility of a certain operation. And from the other side, in the third quadrant, we have, for example, uh, to mention a, a couple, the SWOT analysis or the environmental impact assessment that mostly use qualitative judgment in the form of, uh, for example, uh, reversible impact or non-reversible impact, very positive, very negative. Uh, whereas uh, in the fourth uh, quadrant, we have the quantitative non-monetary method to which uh, the multi-criteria analysis belong, because they make use of quantitative scale, even if uh, they use a different unit of measure, not only the economic and the monetary uh, measure. So in this uh, slide, uh, it's possible also to understand that uh, mm, there is not one method that should be preferred over the other, but the choice of uh, the method to be used in order to support a specific problem strictly depends from the question, the issue that have to be addressed from the stakeholders that are involved and from the impacts that the project is likely to produce uh, on the territory. So depending on the from case to case, um, all the method can consider both monetary and non-monetary impacts, qualitative and quantitative, uh, value information and factual information, and deterministic, uh, let's say, approaches and stochastic um, probabilistic uh, approaches. But um, we have to focus more on multi-criteria analysis given uh, the choice that I did on, uh, on my talk. So multi-criteria analysis uh, um, are an evaluation method as uh, I presented in the previous taxonomy. They were born in the 60s approximately in the, the, in the um, subject in the discipline that are more related to maths and operational sciences, especially for solving a military uh, problem, whereas later on they uh, came to our, let's say, uh, field of application that are more related to uh, urban planning and environmental uh, assessment. So they can be used for uh, making a comparative assessment of alternative project or different measure and different criteria, as the name says, can be taken into account simultaneously, uh, as well as uh, they are they allow to integrate the opinion of the different stakeholders that can be involved in the decision problem. And um, the final uh, uh, result are usually uh, provide advice and recommendation for future activities in order to inform the decision making process. Uh, from I, I go a little bit quickly. Of course, multi criteria refer to an umbrella term is not a specific method, but a variety of method belongs to this family and the different classification again and taxonomy have been proposed in the literature. The most, uh, let's say, useful and common is the taxonomy that you see uh, in this slide that usually divide the method according to the nature of the output produced by the method. That can be priority vectors or ranking of different alternatives rather than classification or sorting method and other different, um, let's say, uh, typology of output. The majority of the method that we normally use in our application refer to ranking method because we normally face a set of alternative options and we help the decision maker or the planner or the designer to pick up the best performing solution according to a number of criteria and considering the opinion of the relevant stakeholder. Um, different steps have been, uh, no matter which is the method, um, different steps have been uh, recognized in the literature for delivering a multi-criteria analysis. So the first one uh, is related to the um, definition of the goal, of course, of the evaluation. 
and uh, uh, the most important uh, stakeholder and key player. And step one is also referring, is also referred as the construction of the socio-technical system for the evaluation, mixing the technical part of the evaluation and the social contribution of the different doctors. Of course, the definition of the option, um, the definition of the criteria, that uh, uh, should be considered for uh, comparing the option. Uh, the description of the performance of each option against uh, the, the criteria. And step five uh, is related to a fundamental uh, um, step in multi-criteria, which is the weighting process. So it's uh, involved uh, roughly, very roughly speaking, to associate a coefficient of importance to the different criteria in order to reflect the opinion of the several participants in the decision process in relation to the importance of the different aspects for reaching the final goal of the evaluation. Then we, we have to combine the weights to examine the result and of course to test the model by means of a sensitivity analysis. That is a sort of what if question in order to see what happens to the final result if we change the input uh, of the model. Very quickly, I will go to a, an application that uh, uh, illustrates uh, step after step uh, this uh, main uh, uh, let's say, uh, elements. So it's a real world uh, transformation in which we have been involved into a multidisciplinary team with some colleagues of uh, um, planning and uh, architectural uh, composition. And it is in the is, uh, city of Taranto in southern Italy. It refers to a grey field transformation as it, there is in the area shopping mall that should be, let's say, uh, reused and reintegrated in the surrounding uh, in the surrounding area. So in this case, we face a, uh, we face a multi methodological approach where we try to follow all the steps of the transformation, uh, running from the very general um, let's say master plan at the urban context in which we apply the stakeholder analysis and the SWOT analysis, the multi criteria phase. The feasibility analysis with the uh, discounted cash flow analysis for assessing the economic feasibility of the master plan. And finally, the cost effectiveness analysis for testing the, the uh, um, uh, environmental sustainability of the project. And finally, we came up with some planning and guidelines of intervention. So the first analysis quickly is uh, related to a stakeholder analysis. I won't enter into the details, but in this case, uh, the evaluation started from the, a survey of the relevant stakeholder having a role in the transformation, and we mapped them through this uh, social network analysis, which is a very well-known method in order to produce a stakeholder map that allow to identify the most central actors, such as, for example, in this case, the Taranto municipality or the company owning uh, the area under transformation and less relevant uh, stakeholder. Another very important uh, analysis is the SWOT analysis uh, in which uh, we apply the steep uh, evaluation, meaning that uh, the category of the SWOT uh, have been uh, integrated with the category of the steep uh, that are social, technological, environmental, economic and political elements. And this analysis allow to, um, let's say, structure the initial complexity of a decision problem, uh, highlighting uh, the most relevant element that are, for example, in the category of strengths, for example, uh, the good climatic condition under the environmental dimension or the high real estate value under the economic dimension. Or as another example, under the opportunity category, for example, the presence of a, uh, pre, uh, the creation, the future creation of a cycle route under the technological dimension or the possibility of valorizing foreign tourism under the economic dimension. So uh, the structuring of the initial complexity uh, by means of SWOT analysis and stakeholder analysis allow to frame 
the general decision problem and to support the construction and definition of alternative scenarios for the evaluation that we can see uh, in this slide. So we started from the state of the art, so no intervention compared to uh, all the plan that was approved by previous uh, um, authority, but uh, uh, overtaken by the actual municipal plan. And a couple of um, alternative project proposal that develop in different way uh, the, the activities uh, in the transformation. One is focusing more on creating new landmark and new image for that area. Another one is more related to um, producing new uh, housing and residential services in the area. And another one that mix more the green board, the residential function with the natural spaces and for social activities, um, considering also the presence of a new cycle route all around uh, the area. So uh, from the point of view of the multi-criteria analysis, a specific method that is the PROMITE method has been applied that um, let's say consider a number of uh, steps that are um, uh, summarized in the present uh, uh, slide. The idea is that each uh, um, couple of actions are compared through specific preference uh, function that allows to assess how much one alternative is preferred over another alternative. So this evaluation is then translated using a uniform scale that ranges from zero uh, to one in order to compare the pairways pair all the couple of alternatives. The, 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 the general preference degree is finally computed as in the equation that you can see in this slide, considering also the weight, so the importance of the different criteria considered in the evaluation. And finally, I don't enter the details, but the different scores are aggregated in order to provide a complete ranking, so the priority of, uh, of the, the action. So in this slide, we can see for the, 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 the family of the criteria that we use for the evaluation that range from environmental aspects, social aspects, or economic, of course, and urban uh, aspects. As you can see, we consider it both quantitative and qualitative criteria, and criteria that have to be maximized and minimized in order to reach the overall goal of the transformation. This slide just represents the so-called performance metrics where the different alternatives are evaluated against uh, the different criteria that is the starting point for the uh, evaluation. Another very important part of the evaluation considers the involvement of the different actors that are involved in with the, using specific protocols for weighting definitions, such as uh, in this case. In this case, we involved four different experts, a urban design expert, a cultural heritage expert, a senior marketing analysis that worked in the company placed in the shopping mall and the design team. And in the radar graph, you can see how the different opinion were uh, affecting the final evaluation. Uh, the final score uh, of the performance uh, and the weights uh, have been uh, then aggregated using the equation that I previously uh, shown. Uh, and as you can see in this slide, uh, we can have the final ranking. Uh, according to the uh, different experts, uh, there are two alternatives that perform better than the other, that are the orange one, the green board and the gradient, whereas a number of alternatives that perform very badly and so for sure they have to be excluded from the evaluation. Just to conclude, the very two final step of the analysis were related to the application of discounted cash flow analysis for assessing the feasibility uh, of the best performing solution picked up by multi-criteria analysis using the usual uh, discounted cash flow uh, metrics uh, where the cost and the benefits 
in, in the form of the income are compared in order to compute profitability indicators in the form of a net present value and internal rate of return. And finally, at the building level, a specific indicator work was calculated in order to uh, assess the cost effectiveness of the investment uh, in terms of the final green area delivered by uh, the operation. So to go to some conclusion, uh, we can see that uh, um, all the, uh, the, the steps um, were useful for following, let's say, the development of the overall project and delivering uh, very, uh, let's say, uh, high-level uh, um, project. Before uh, ending the talk, I would just to, let's say, uh, introduce and present uh, the, the overall group that is composed also by Caterina Caprioli and Federico Dell'Anna, who works with me uh, in, in this kind of uh, research. We are here not for delivering properly multi-criteria analysis, but other methods that belong to our um, study especially for estimating externality produced by urban infrastructure due to the high competence that you have in your center. We have the possibility and the opportunities of learning a lot. And so again, thank for this uh, exchange. And especially we apply machine learning and endonic pricing model facing different case studies that range from cycle path route and light rail network. So we will be more than happy to have uh, question and uh, uh, feedback also for uh, this, uh, this part of our uh, uh, research activity. Thank you. So I think we have about uh, uh, 10 minutes or so for, for questions. So if anyone's got one. Uh, and again, online, if you want to uh, raise your digital hand or put a question into the chat, either way. Oh, Bob, Tom. Mm -hmm. um, well, I done sort of similar sort of research area. I do uh, multi criteria, I mean, uh, multi criteria analysis for uh, land decision for particular mm. uh, agricultural business. So um, that's an interesting project. But one of the challenges we have is that um, because we have uh, so many, you know, the variable, which is the uh, factors need to consider yeah. when make a decision. Yes. And we sometimes it's very tricky to weigh them, you know, like, you know, which factors might be more important yes. or particularly the science area, agricultural business, crops and meat and pigs, they all requirement is different. Some is a humidity more important, some is temperature more important. So how do you actually weigh this complicated okay. data set? Yes, this, thank you very much for this uh, uh, observation because um, uh, this is a, let's say, crucial step in multi-criteria analysis uh, that involve um, both the structuring of the problem, so the definition of the criteria family and the waiting uh, uh, and the waiting phase. So according to my experience and uh, especially the literature, the scientific literature, um, the majority, the, 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 a big effort should be placed by the analyst in structuring the criteria family because the criteria should represent the all the elements and especially the point of view of the actor. So all the actors should recognize their value in the criteria family once that is uh, produced. And there are also specific methods that belongs more in the, to the field of problem structuring method that are more, uh, uh, let's say, soft um, evaluation, um, let's say, uh, method. Uh, which help exactly in, uh, in in these kind of activities. And the second one is the waiting phase. This is again uh, a tricky phase because um, it's uh, always very, very difficult also. Um, and for example, depending from the method, I didn't mention it before, but there are different um, uh, protocols for waste uh, uh, elicitation. For example, I mentioned the deck of card method that is one of the most popular in the, um, the multi-criteria analysis. Uh, 
uh, but uh, of course is a uh, let's say very um, I would say very uh, demanding uh, demanding uh, issue, but uh, it is fundamental for a let's say good uh, result mm. uh, of the of the evaluation. And for example, questionnaire or focus group or uh, workshop are uh, all uh, let's say approach that uh, are very valuable in uh, in this kind of uh, activities but of course uh, it's a uh, um, extremely uh, difficult and demanding uh, task in, in the analysis yes thank you mm -hmm. I just want to thank you as it's very a comprehensive way of looking at all the different aspects of the other project um, and I, I particularly like how you had the SWOT analysis and the with the various uh, quantitative and qualitative areas um, I do see that I do agree that the waiting as, as a final decision making part, the waiting is very crucial. Mm -hmm. And while you may have um, options which are strongly superior in every waiting to another option, there may be some cases where according to the waiting, one option becomes superior or another comes superior. So in that case where you have that, do you ever like get a whole sample of different like preferences of the waitings? And then look at maybe the variation to try to and how does that work? yes for example it, it was not our case because uh, uh, sorry eh? if i can uh, can right, i i'll uh, i'll share your slides uh, sorry okay okay it was not our case because uh, for example uh, okay in our case uh, according to the opinion of the different experts, so the weights, okay, the, uh, produced by the different experts, we have uh, two options that are very similar and always performing very well. But for example, in this case, we have different inversion of priorities according to the, to the opinion of the expert. So this is a, a good way also for testing the robustness and the sensitivity uh, of the model. If you have a uh, huge variation uh, in the ranking according to the different set of weight considered, so the opinion of the different uh, stakeholder. This means that uh, the final results are not enough stable, are not enough robust to be communicated. And so the recommendation that you want to give to your client, decision maker, is not so robust. So this means that you should, for example, include other criteria, uh, in the evaluation or uh, changing, for example, the metrics of the criteria. So this means that uh, there is something that uh, um, it's a warning, uh, let's say, let's say like this. Or uh, on the contrary, if you are able to explain very well this variation, this could be, let's say, of help. Thanks, Mara. Very comprehensive. I'm just wondering, can you talk a little bit about the implementation as in mm. you know you've done this it looks like okay. as a real world process um where are you with that and did the de final decision maker or okay. the governing body decide and agree okay. with your final selection like you know you okay. go through this process okay. have they adopted your final option or okay. where are you in the process okay uh, yes uh, in, in in this particular case uh, we work at the, in a research project uh, let's say where the client uh, was uh, let's say the um, the company owing uh, the shopping mall uh, that is the Ocean and uh, I don't remember I asked uh, Federico <laughs> because he was with me Federico which is um, Citrus uh, which is a real estate company basically yeah. uh, managing all the commercial assets of a huge uh, commercial company of a shopping center in Europe based on in France that is uh, Ocean and uh, so they ask they had the possibility of uh, let's say asking for research project to the university and they asked some uh, possible solution for uh, the implementation of their shopping mall so finally we worked with them both from the point of view of the design also involving students and other uh, colleagues for this part of the discipline and we involved them for example in the in the waiting phase 
for example, the senior marketing analysis was a representative of the company, and we delivered them the final, uh, the final result with the, our recommendation for the implementation. And this was basically the final, uh, no, the final delivery mm -hmm. of our research. It was uh, pre-COVID, so maybe something uh, um, w w was uh, went wrong uh, also from their uh, planning uh, economic activities but uh, okay this uh, this is more or less uh, the the structure of uh, this the decision problem in other case uh, we had the opportunity of working for the public authorities for example, so the public authorities want to develop a specific area, a specific regeneration process, especially this is very common in our city. And so they have different, for example, possible function for the reuse of a former industrial building or different, uh, let's say, possible uh, destination or different uh, uh, project and so on. And so we try to help them in uh, structuring also the process for uh, um, implementing the transformation. I think uh, we might need to stop there so we can okay. switch. Uh, but okay. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, also, I'm very grateful to be here, as Marco said, to present and to be doing this visit in research period. So, um, as you already presented us, so I'll go straight directly into the topic of the presentation. I'm talking about university cities and university cities because this has been um, quite a topic in the past years for me and uh, a part of my colleagues uh, in the department, in the same department, which, believe me, in Italian is even longer than eight. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, um, that's just to show that I usually have fashion hairs. And uh, um, also, I want to acknowledge, as uh, it has been done, um, the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respect to the elders past and present. I extend their respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. And they are here, but all the rest has already been said <laughs> wonderfully by Chris. So why universities matters? Why? Um, because to me, what also, it was also um, um, a sort of a, an issue to deal with university because it's like looking at ourselves and studying ourselves. Um, so maybe can be not particularly interesting, but I think instead that it's quite interesting to study universities from an urban geography uh, perspective, because um, universities are for sure important actors in the knowledge economy, which more or less with different names shape our economies globally. Uh, and you can think of examples like Bangalore, or Boston and Cambridge that are clearly cities that are both university cities and knowledge economy hub and important economic hubs. Um, in case of post-industrial cities like Torino, Turin, uh, our city or Pittsburgh or some uh, northern England cities, it's even more important because uh, they are quite strategic actors. Uh, for the economic uh, development in post-industrial scenarios. Um, and for instance, we, we wrote an article together with a colleague from Poland, from the city of Uch, which is another post-industrial city um, that I, I, uh, you can see here on uh, student geographies and studentscapes in post-industrial cities and on the role of universities in diversifying the economy and boosting the economy. Um, but to say uh, even more, we can consider that usually globally, we say it considers universities with three missions. They we all have three missions. So the education mission, so to create knowledge, 
the research to, to advance in, the, in knowledge and in innovation and also the social role that's which according to the depending on where uh, you are looking at it's called the third mission in Italy it's called third mission or the outreach or whatever you want to call it um, that prefers to societal challenges and social impact but I would say that um, we should add a fourth mission to this so as explicitly economic um, mission of universities because uh, we cannot but see universities as urban entrepreneurs um, that have both direct and indirect effects on cities and urban areas in general. Direct because they literally produce cities, create cities, so have uh, with new facilities and uh, investments, or indirect because um, through their direct uh, impact, they also have effects on local areas and local population change. Um, so um, it is a different perspective on entrepreneurial universities. Um, and then I just discovered that, for instance, I just took that from the UN uh, SW strategy update 2025, that these universities recognize that as Australia's number one entrepreneurial university. So it's clearly one of um, the role that universities have. And so why not discuss it? Well, analyze it, study, and discuss it. But how can we look at universities? Because first and foremost, universities are frequently, and surely in common wisdom, public institution. When they are private, they have a public role. Um, so we are speaking of, a, of an economic actor with a very peculiar uh, role of a public institution. Um, they operate or should operate for common good, for the common good, the advancement of knowledge and education of uh, the population, uh, but also they are publicly scrutinized when uh, with their spending, for instance. So we, we are not a norm, let's say, um, an average economic actor as university. Um, and, they should, we should um, better the society as a whole. So universities are for sure economic actors, even if we don't take, we don't consider their fourth mission, um, because they have this role of um, investing and attract investment uh, and also be a leverage for investment um, almost globally, I, I would say. And so we can consider them as university, uh, as uh, urban developers um, with a massive impact, impact on neighborhoods, where they are, where they are located, um, whatever they invest, whenever they invest. Um, furthermore, they attract a lot of investments and interest from uh, private investors, for instance, student accommodation. The image that you can see in this slide is about the spatial distribution of uh, uh, Turin's uh, purpose-built student accommodation. But what it, what it is interesting, uh, it's not necessary that you see the colors or that you see the, the, the what is uh, specifically uh, each symbol represent, is the huge number of student accommodation that has been built in the city, I would say in 20 years and in the, in the next 10 years. Um, and I would also say that in Torino, this is at the moment one of the most important, uh, you know, typology of investment from private investors. Get students from abroad, give them a house, not particularly cheap accommodation, um, and uh, let's do business. So who and what lies at the margins of all this, um, what is happening? For sure, students, um, especially non-local students uh, in Pacific, uh, because um, if you read every document by universities, ours certainly does. Um, they are considered as the most important asset of the university, but I would say that it's a resource that usually extracted rather than valorized. Um, for sure, for students, there is an issue uh, regarding accommodation, affordability and availability in cities. In a uh, lot uh, of the cases also that I've uh, worked on, uh, uh, students are used as um, unwilling pioneers of gentrification mm -hmm. to regenerate parts of the city that need a regeneration, whatever need uh, means. Um, and also there is this particular situation because students are a mobile um, population, but 
that usually stays for three or five or two years in the city. So it's a mobile population, but not like tourists. They are staying in the city, living in the city, transforming the city and being part as they are engaged in the city. Um, and for sure, uh, another uh, part um, of the population that stays at the margin of all these processes, at least from the point of view of how we study or how we pay attention to these processes, is the local population that is, that is again impacted by universities' development policies, again for housing affordability and availability, um, but also for one um, aspect that is um, considered that of the fact of the, the, the change of the commercial structure or the leisure structure in cities um, that adapts to the younger population, to that young, mobile university student population. Again, there's a, a decent example of an article that we published on um, students being unwilling pioneers of gentrification processes using Turing as a case study. Um, what am I working on at the moment? Because as I said, this has been uh, uh, an important part of my research. And when I say mine, it's just, just mine. I mean, in this case, mine, but uh, with a lot of colleagues, uh, many of whom are the authors of the article that I showed you um, in the past years. Um, um, especially two projects that I think can have um, a certain influence, um, uh, also my interest in Sydney that I will tell you about in, in a moment. Um, I'm currently the principal investigator in a, a departmental project on monitoring university student population in the city, especially the uh, non-local university student population. When I say non-local, I try to gather together people that are not from Torino, but maybe from the region or from the rest of Italy and foreign students. So that's why I say non-local. And our aim is to um, that to create an, an observatory, a monitoring uh, instrument um, at the city level, at the urban area level. Um, so uh, trying to develop a database that connect uh, existing database that at the moment are not talking to each other, even from the two main university in the city, so the Politecnico and the University of Torino. Um, research on the right to education as part of the broader right of the city, uh, to the city. And also um, um, coordinate the network of interested and impacted actors. And what we want to do is also to include students going in a different way than just involving the, representative, uh, the, the, the official representative of students in the uh, different universities uh, through forums. We would like to involve students in this coordination team uh, of the um, Observatorio. In the meantime, we just won a national project uh, funded by the Ministry for University and Research, which is again on uh, students. So it's also interesting that there is quite a, um, 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 uh, sorry for the play of words, an interest uh, by uh, actors at different levels, so, um, at the national level, but also at the local level on this topic, because for sure they, we all realize that uh, when we are dealing with universities that are expanding, that are bigger and bigger, um, this has a huge impact on cities development. So in this case, the project is about, uh, again, um, a student housing dynamics as a driver of urban change um, on students struggle to find housing because this is uh, what I think a real problem. Uh, also because there is a big competition with other short-term accommodation supply. If you want to insert Airbnb there, you can, uh, as a keyword. Um, and also in the role of universities and their attraction capacity in relation to cities, urban strategies and student mobilities. This image is again one of the things that we, one of the uh, uh, image that we produced uh, recently as a group. Um, and it only shows the number of Polito students in a 200 meter radius in uh, the pandemic year in the city of Torino. So it's quite widespread um, in the city, but of course with a concentration uh, where the biggest facilities of the Politecnico uh, are. Why is Sydney an interesting case? Um, two things that I just took uh, from the City of Sydney website. Um, one uh, that says that uh, 10, well, almost 11% of the population of the city of Sydney, 
as the city of Sydney, uh, is um, made up of, of people attending university. Quite interesting. And then, uh, why it's important to the city of Sydney, the education sector, because of it uh, contributes with a lot of money to the state economy, but also um, it's a small part of the text that I um, copied here. 40% uh, of all the education providers in New South Wales are located in the city of Sydney. So if the New South Wales, uh, uh, total New South Wales in January 2023 has more than 200,000 international students, roughly, we can say 40% are here. And how does the city cope with this huge amount of students and universities? How do they cope with this? Um, I will start with the student accommodation. As you will see, actually, what I will do in my visiting period is not about student accommodation. But there's a reason for that. Um, but I would like to start with, with this because just if you look at um, the biggest player um, in the area, um, I found that these few, um, well, these are their sites, their websites. So they advertise uh, the availability in different buildings uh, in the city. So in this case, these are just images. And of course, you know exactly where they are. But in the following slide, they also provide a map. And what it is, what is interesting that these big players, they are all clustered around the University of Sydney. So in a specific area of the city, not all over the city. If you remember the map of Torino, in the case of Torino, uh, these players, most of them um, are different because in Europe, we have some players which are mainly British, Dutch, and some North American players. Um, they are distributed along the metro line in the city of Torino or close to the university facilities. Mm -hmm. In this case, they are clustered there. So I see there as a very interesting um, decision that probably Marta and her group and uh, they have helped um, these companies cluster there, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but student accommodation, I think it's just one warning sign of potential impact of universities, because of course we can see them as separate things. So big players play their game and university play their game. But I would say that uh, this doesn't um, go well with the idea that as universities, we have a social responsibility in what we do. Um, so student accommodation is just one warning sign of potential impacts of university in, city, in cities, as you can see, from the previous slide, um, but also students can have different form of accommodation. In Turin, in 2021, we had a survey and 86% of this uh, international students live in apartments in rented flats. So the huge majority is not mapped if you just consider a student housing as student accommodation. Hmm? Uh, also, students' distribution and daily activities, it's not just for uh, accommodation, but because they are here because of education, but they also have leisure time, they, they, they live in the city. So their distribution um, uh, and where they spend their time is also important to anticipate transformation in cities. In, then again, this is a picture of um, the first article that I mentioned in which we studied in Butch, in Poland and in Torino, the distribution of uh, the activities uh, serving 1000 students in the city of Torino. And so you see the, the um, uh, uh, yellow is where they go for education daily. The uh, blue, light blue is where they go for leisure activities, whatever leisure, any kind of leisure activity. And the pink is where they uh, live where they are distributed in terms of where they live. So, of course, this is very interesting for the city, for all of us, the city as a municipality, the city as an, an economic uh, developer, but also for citizens. Um, so uh, I would say that considering this, uh, considering, uh, considering also my limited time here, because I'm going to stay here for just one month, um, I, I want to start to uh, um, understand um, let's say students get the urban development, considering uh, spatial development of one big player in specific this university, or the other possibility, 
um, is to study, but I think I will go with the first one. But the other possibility is to study uh, multiple big players, multiple universities, in this case, in one urban area in Sydney. Uh, just to start to create a map, not of what the students uh, are doing, but where the universities are expanding, investing, and so starting to imagine the, the effect on the rest. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks for your presentation. And uh, I, I know that Italy has uh, has a it's a, as a national like policy. It has been, maybe I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. It's been uh, attracting like a large number of international students and even incent giving incentives to international mm -hmm. students. Um, I wonder if there were any housing accommodation plan during at or at the early stages of these uh, policies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is this is my first. And I have a second question. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to to answer this and then add the second question? I have a very limited. Okay. <laughs> 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 so it's better to do this. Uh, it's, we don't have national policies in Italy. We rarely have national policies, certainly not in university in strategic development. So it's usually universities, some universities that started. So the biggest universities started to uh, have all these international internationalization pros, um, strategies, which means to attract international students. So I would say it depends where you go. Um, you can see this process starting 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Mm, I don't think uh, uh, before, unless you go to the American uh, University in Florence, but that's the American University in Florence. Um, Southern Italy, quite recent, because it's commonly known as the less developed part of the country economically, so there is no national framework mm, there. Um, no housing strategy for for accommodation of the students at all. So we are actually in a very uh, we are very late, um, and, and there there are very a small number of uh, beds or or rooms uh, for students. Certainly not enough uh, for um, any typology of students. Even if you consider national students, the national not enough. What is interesting is that because of COVID, we had a recovery plan at the European level. Italy has had the major, the massive, uh, the biggest amount of money from the European Union. Part of it is for university housing, student accommodation, but not in form of a direct investment, but they subsidize private investors to build student accommodation. And usually a private investor has to make money, of course, on an investment. And so this is not going to be cheap accommodation for students. So there are some regulations that say if you build 100 rooms, 20 must be on the cheaper side and then the other on the market side. Uh, but still, mm -hmm. it's quite different from my direct investment in student accommodation. Yeah, and, uh, speaking of your um... National Research Project. Yeah. Um, I wonder, uh, is it uh, you, you? You included the applies there, but I wonder, uh, is there any implementation or any strategy recommendation at the end of your research? Because I've seen like tens of research projects in Australia studying how students, how what, what are the students' living condition, and the problems are. Almost the same, overcrowding, un unaffordability. Mm -hmm. But finally, the strategy goes to purpose built accommodation as we. Of course. Like there is approval for four new towers here in Kensington, and they're not going to be cheap. These incentives are not going to give back to students. Mm -hmm. I want to know is there any ground for like policy or regulations coming from your research? Uh, for student housing in Turin, maybe. Um, again, I don't think not at the national level, even if that is a national project. I think you were referring to the 
second mm. one. Yeah, the second one. Um, not at the national level. Uh, if there are, there is a possibility for us to impact on possible decisions uh, at the local level, at the regional and local level, because again, in Italy, the um, student um, housing is a regional uh, competence, not the local municipal competence. Mm. So if there is a possibility is at that level, not at the national level, also because it's a very diverse situation in Italy, as I was trying to tell you by explaining the internationalization policies. So uh, what you can do in a good way for Torino or Milano even, which is even bigger and interesting case also, um, would not work for Naples or Bari or other cities or even Rome. Um, you always end with some re recommendation, but if I have to be a little bit optimistic in terms of uh, the impact that we can have, it's with the first project. So to create an observatory that monitors the situation yearly and works together with the um, municipality, because the municipality in the case is a partner of the project. I more into like it's a modus region rather than direct. Uh, action because in a way you talk, you work with them and you show them what what is happening rather than suggesting them you have to do this to do that. I I, I must be realistic. Yeah. Is there allowed one more question? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Just <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, here on no. Yeah. Um. Just pick one. Um, yeah. Well, I just back to the um, the point that a uh, lot of university in terms of regional economic growth. Mm -hmm. And um, when we actually looking at the United States University, it's kind of, you know, the university is like the economic engine within the mm -hmm. state. You know, you see that they have a stadium, yeah. with the, you know, 100,000 of people and they generate you know, a lot of income. Mm -hmm. And they even manufacturing sector, they you know produce you yeah, know yeah. some product to sell. Mm -hmm. So I just like to see your sort of view, you know, the beyond the housing affordability and the student mobility. What you see the global university role is that we might be go beyond that. Is something we do. Mm. Um, you know, I just like to your view. Mm. That, so how far we go? Mm -hmm. you know? um, okay. And, um... I, I would say this, that uh, from the point of view of uh, the American model, as you were mentioning that model, I think we are, I don't know about Australia. I would say in Italy, we are going a little bit in that direction. Because we are becoming more and more an important economic actors in urban areas. So you, even if you don't want to go in that direction, you are asked to become an economic player. You are asked to, to have a, a startup center that works with local companies and also with global companies. You are asked to internationalize and to attract students for the local economy. Maybe not exactly in that, uh, like that, but um, I think ideally we are moving towards um, that direction. Um, whether it can work everywhere, I don't think so. Um, and also, again, the, the case of Torino is quite specific because um, it's an economy that was heavily industrial economy, it was an industrial city, then it is still an industrial city. But usually we don't talk about industrial cities that are still industrial cities. We always call them in post-industrial, as if there is no industry or production anymore, but it still is there. Um, but then the university has become a very important factor. In a, in a way, even more important than it is actually, because parts of the city are changing because of university investments. If a university decides to move or to have new facilities in an area of the city, you, usually it is in agreement with the, with the municipalities and other players, and they are their intention is to reshape that part of the city. Mm -hmm. I think something like this is happening also here, I mean. If you see all the strategies of different actors, so um, I would say that that idea of a very powerful university is um, at least in Italy quite in some cities in Italy quite similar to that of the United States. One question, or two questions actually. Um, you know my essential part. 
I'll start with the easy one. Yes. I'll start with the difficult one first. <laughs> um, what was the impact on Turin during COVID with regards to student accommodation and the impact on the economy? And was that a big disruptor basically going from because um, in Australia we were basically all online. Um, mm -hmm. How did that influence, um, you know, student accommodation and the economy broader in um, Turin? City. Mm. Um, everything went online, of course, because maybe all of you know that Italy one had one of the um, severest lockdowns um, in the world. I think you I mean, maybe, with, maybe with Melbourne. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the same. So it was completely everything was shut down, and and um, um, we went online for let's say one semester completely, and then we started with some hybrid forms. But uh, since last academic year, our university and also the University of Torino, the two big players, we decided to go full in presence. So there's no more online uh, lessons. This means that they have also calculated well. Um, this uh, option because we were all afraid that to stay online would have meant that the university would have chosen to say, okay, let's keep uh, everything online because students will enroll anyway, they won't come here, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But then they decided to do it, and uh, I think we are quickly going back to the same amount of uh, enrollments that we had before uh, COVID. Quickly. Maybe something is shifting, then. Enrollment from international students also depends on a lot on geopolitics, uh, but um, we are going back to that. And my second question is, Turin was host of the Winter Olympic Games. 2006. Did that, with the infrastructure for the games, assist in student accommodation? Was the games accommodation or was it in a different part of it? Um, I would say that um, one or two athletes' uh, residences uh, then became students' accommodation, uh, public students' accommodation, but that's it. Yeah. Now, in 2025, we will host the Universiad, which is a weird word, uh, but exists actually. So it's the University Olympic Games, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and in 2025, the idea is to Again, finance big players to build student accommodation to host students, more students. Yeah. Yes, I don't know if. Yeah, okay, that's a yeah. more question. Um, in Australia, we have mostly campus based universities that mm -hmm. are quite, quite defined mm -hmm. and in some ways separated from the areas around them, except yeah. maybe for RMIT in Melbourne, which is embedded in the city. Yeah. I'm wondering, given their importance to the city uh, economically, what difference does it make as to whether they're more integrated with the city or more campus-based uh, universities? Because, for example, to give a trivial example, the co coffee shops here close at three o'clock. Yeah. Whereas if in the embedded ones, they stay open on the streets. Yeah. Uh, in Italy, we have very few campus universities. Um, so we mostly have universities that are spread in the city. And so the impact on the city, I would say that it's more evident immediately yeah, yeah. or sooner than it can be with yeah. campus university. But let me, a sort of a joke, uh, but um, I don't see, uh, do you think that this university is a campus university? This one? Yeah. Very much. Or multiple campus. Yeah, but. But they're, they're, they're quite defined in terms of land ownership and development. Uh, well, that's the same in terms of land, or, uh, land uh, ownership. It's the same in Italy. I mean, uh, the the central campus, is, in fact, it's called campus, yeah. the Politecnico, is somehow mimicking this idea of a campus, mm. but still it's quite very much embedded in the city. So, um, yes, it is different, but for me, the, dif the main difference is that it impacts um, Stooner, the neighbourhood mm. in which the university expands or is. But I would say that, especially in terms of the structure of the student housing, student accommodation, mm -hmm. not only in terms of housing, but also rented flats, rooms, etc. Um, even campus university, they are have an effect which is much wider. Um, of course, yeah. than, but we don't usually study this. I mean, at least in Italy, mm -hmm. it's like we take care of what is exactly inside mm -hmm. our perimeter. Mm -hmm. It's easier. 
I mean, we might wrap it up there since yeah. we're a little over time, but uh, uh, great questions. So I'd like to thank uh, Marta and Marco again for their presentations and for you. Uh, for Uh, and for everybody else, our last uh, seminar for the term is next Friday. Uh, Nicole Cook from uh, University of Wollongong is going to present. So hopefully we'll see you all next week as well. All right. Okay. Thanks again. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.